So welcome to laboratory room 304. It'll be famous like room 101 in, uh, what was that book, uh, 1984, when they put the rat cage on people's heads or anything. <laughs> room 101. Now, this is room 304. And 304 has all sorts of Frankenstein and experiments going on. What we're doing in here is we are taking these international bulk container tanks, the square tanks that you find with cages all over the place. And we've developed a way, a very easy way, of using them to make an endless supply of renewable energy and fertilizer based on food waste, cafeteria waste. And what we do is we, anybody here have one of these under their kitchen sink? The food disposal. Insincorator, sometimes known as the garbage disposal. Anybody? Nobody has one? New Yorkers generally don't. 50% of American households have them, particularly as you move west, Midwest to west. Uh, that's because there was a ridiculous law in New York City for a long time saying that it might clog the pipes. And then studies were done and proved that no, it actually improves the flow of waste through pipes. And it's better to have food waste in your pipes along with toilet waste than just toilet waste. Because the food waste then turns into methane gas at a higher rate at the wastewater treatment plant, making it economically favorable to capture that methane and use it not only to run the plant, but also to get, sell electricity back to the city. So food waste into energy is one of the big frontiers in renewable energy. And we're doing experiments here at Mercy to prove the science of that. So we have this insincorator, and then we have this bicycle-powered insincorator here for countries. We're working in Chad and in Rio de Janeiro and the favelas, and our idea is if you don't have electricity, you should still be able to grind your food waste. And, you know, toss in... Well, you should have somebody else do it, like your little brother or sister. Toss in things like your orange peels, your banana peels, your avocado pits. Toss them inside, and then, uh, you know, grind, grind them up. So, then the felt would come up. <laughs> so, we're still working on that. This was developed by the Insincorator Corporation for us. They are sponsors of our work. They donate Insincorators. And I can actually uh, say that if any of you want to build one of these in your own home then we can probably get you an insincorator to go along with it because we want you to turn your food waste into a solution rather than a problem. No rats, no flies, no smells, no need to compost, no garbage trucks coming by. Your food waste is the most reliable source of solar energy available in the world today. Rain or shine, 365 days a year, day or night, doesn't matter. You always have food waste. And it is solar energy because the sun grew those plants that you then threw the peel out of. So that's solar energy in a big, big, big way. How to use your disposal in the most environmentally responsible manner, recycle your food waste, and turn it into, into methane gas, and then you don't need landfills. We can completely eliminate landfills and make recycling easy for everybody. That's the mission of Emerson Electronics and Syncorator Corporation. That's our mission here at Mercy. And so <clears throat> what we do is we grind up the food waste and we feed it into a pipe that goes down to the bottom of this tank. Now this we consider like a sacred cow, an artificial sacred cow, and this is his throat. The insincorator is his jaws and teeth. This is the cow's throat. Then there's an esophagus that goes into the cow's stomach, so you can study anatomy when you're doing this, building a sort of Frankenstein cow. And then he's got these ureters where he pees, and that becomes fertilizer going into buckets down here that we then take and we grow hydroponics with. It's the best fertilizer in the world. It contains all the micronutrients and all the NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. A farmer or a home gardener doesn't need to ever go to a shop and buy fertilizer ever again because it's all in our food waste with no composting. It's a liquid and you can just pour it or irrigate your plants or even grow without soil. Just do it hydroponically. Then the gas that comes out we're storing in these big truck inner tubes temporarily, and then we take the inner tubes over and we vent them into a collection vessel. Now, in my own home in Germany where I live, I don't use inner tubes. I have two of these tanks in greenhouses. All of my food waste goes automatically from my kitchen sink. I just press a button, it's ground up and goes inside. And then it gets stored in a giant one of these that's on our porch. So every day the gas just goes into here and it rises this bucket up. And imagine a big bucket like this. And then my wife and I just turn on the gas and we cook. Or we run electric generators off of it or run gas lamps or run refrigerators. There's gas-powered refrigerators. So anything you need to do, it's methane gas, natural gas. So what we're going to do is we're going to light it. Um, you don't have to even stand back. It's not dangerous. You can even come closer. But somebody please turn off the light. And then somebody else give me a light. 
Okay, I'm going to slowly open this. Go ahead and turn it on. Okay. So this is the methane that everybody's buying in propane bottles, natural gas bottles. This is the same equivalent flame. It's very hot, very safe. It's, uh, in this case, it's about 70% uh, methane and 30% carbon dioxide. I'm just going to open a big flare up now to show you <laughs> that's the flame of it. <clears throat> can turn the lights back on. And you can applaud to nature. So you can applaud to nature. Thank you, little guys. Little guys there. Those are called the methanogens, the archaea, the oldest life forms on the planet. You've probably read about them. Of all the kingdoms, there's six kingdoms of life, right? So you've got your plants, you've got your animals. Keep going with me. What else you got? You've been studying it. You <laughs> just took a test, you guys. I gave you plants and animals. Oh, Another kingdom. We're not even thinking oh, yeah. anymore. We're on. Huh? <laughs> Uh, mammalia is in the, in the animal kingdom. Some of us are vegetables. Um, so <laughs> plants and animals, there's the fungi, okay, fungus, mushrooms and, and uh, athlete's foot. Um, and then you've got the protozoa, right, so your paramecium and your amoeba. And then you've got the monarin kingdom, which are the bacteria. And then there's a sixth kingdom they just discovered, which are the archaea, which are more ancient than bacteria. They look a lot like them, but if you saw Green Lantern, anybody see Green Lantern? Yeah. Remember that movie and the guy who turns into the fear monger when he's in this classroom with his students, he's going, these are the archaea. They're as different from bacteria as we are from bacteria, the most ancient life forms on the planet. <laughs> and then he turns into the bad guy and then Green Lantern has to stop. I'm like, why did the filmmakers put that little random scene? Because it's one of the most important discoveries of the 21st century the 20th century, actually, late 20th century, that, uh, that there is this entire other kingdom that was here three and a half billion years ago and will be here when we're extinct and everything else has gone extinct and probably will be the only life form to travel when comets and meteors hit the Earth and knock fragments off. These are the ones that will be traveling through the universe, sporing and waiting until they can find another planet to seed and then start the evolutionary process all over. They're the alpha and the omega. You missed it, but, well, there's it. They're the alpha <laughs> and the omega of, the, of, the, uh, of life of life forms, and they're the ones that are in your gut. Every time you take a poo, they come out of you. They're in the horse manure and the cow manure. We used horse manure for that. They're in lake mud and the sediments at the bottom of the ocean. They're everywhere where oxygen didn't get, or oxygen doesn't get. They, after the cyanobacteria, caused one of the greatest extinctions or the worst extinctions on this planet, wiping out almost all the life forms here. All the different archaea went and found places to get away from the air, and then life radiated out and evolved and became everything we see today based on the ATP-ADP reaction that oxygen, oxidation made possible, right? The use of oxygen. But these guys hung out for billions of years going, we'll have our day again. They'll see. We're important. They're not going to keep us out of here. We're in their guts. We help them digest their food. We make them fart. <laughs> and that's why if you light somebody's fart, it'll go on fire. <laughs> this is just a big cow fart. <laughs> Sorry for my indelicacy. So talk to you all adults. So these are sacred cows that are made of plastic that have horse manure and animal manure. And then we're going to be feeding them. Uh, this month we're going to be using this chemical. It's a very dangerous chemical. This, by the way, has been classified now as a toxin. They talk about potentially dangerous hazardous substances in your classroom. You know what this is? Sucrose. Sugar. <laughs> be very scared. Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> Sucrose, a mess. I mean, look, it's even got chemical formulas like C12, H22O11. Would you trust putting that in your body? So sugar is very dangerous, and it's what we're going to feed the bacteria, and they're going to produce certain quantities of methane that we're going to measure. And then after a month of doing feeding regimes of sugar to see how much we can give them before they burp up acid and they get acid reflux and need to take Tums and other antacids. Once, because it is a stomach, that's what we're going to think of it. It's a, it's a living stomach with these archaeans and a consortia of other bacteria, hydrolytic, acetogenic, acidogenic, a whole bunch, an ecosystem, like a rainforest of archaeans and bacterians that are doing this reaction. And once we know that, then we start working with your cafeteria waste and hopefully, with your help, we will lobby the campus to build giant biodigesters or a big, one big digester down in the area where the big waste dumpsters are. And you have your cafeteria waste every day. Instead of going to landfill, go down into that tank, and then we'll have generators, and it'll generate electricity to power the, the laboratories here. That's the dream. Compl completely doable. Never been done before. Consider it solved. That's the Emerson logo for these guys. Consider it solved. So we're doing the science behind that that will convince the policymakers that, yes, this is a good solution. Over 20 million households in China do this. 
over, uh, I think it's three or four million in India are doing this, uh, half a million in Nepal. It's not like this solution isn't known, but in America, it's very little known. Yeah, it's the first time I heard about yeah. it. Is it? Yeah. Questions, comments like that? Tell me, what's, uh, what's your reaction? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool? Yeah, you yeah. can save electricals. Yeah. <laughs> Probably wondering how much electricity can you get from it? These are 1,000 liter tanks, or 275 gallons, one cubic meter. The Chinese statistics have shown that every cubic meter of gas that you get, so imagine this filled with just gas, unpressurized, just like that was, that is equivalent to cooking on a single burner at a medium flame for two hours, running a two kilowatt electric generator for 45 minutes, driving a truck, because you can drive trucks with this, Natural gas trucks, buses, they have them. Driving a truck for approximately uh, a mile. The equipment could be 0 0.7, almost a mile, three quarters of a mile. And that's out of what? Mm -hmm. um, cubic meter. One cubic meter. If this, is, if this was filled with gas but not compressed into a bottle. Obviously, if you compress it, then you can put a lot more and get a lot more. That's why cars can drive and buses from small tanks. But this is just completely uncompressed, the way it comes out. Then uh, you can also run a refrigerator for approximately 12 hours off of that, and you can create carbon tetrachloride with it for chemical use. So a lot of things you can do. You can run gas lamps, like the Coleman gas lamps people use for camping. You can run them, I've run them off of this for about 15 to 20 hours. So you got light. And then to get this amount of gas, you have to feed it right and you need the right internal surface area. That's what we're gonna be working on here because technically a one cubic meter tank can produce one cubic meters of gas per day technically. However, there's temperature has to be up at body temperature for this to get this maximum output. We have to insert in here a uh, surface area. We are going to be doing, I don't know if I have it here somewhere, no, not around. Uh, we're looking for different things to put in. We, we're just going to settle on pine cones. I've got somewhere around here. Oh, here they are. These are empty tanks, just they have horse manure in them. But bacteria don't like to float. They like to form biofilms. That's why when you wake up in the morning, you have this scum on your teeth. You have to brush away. They don't just hang out in your saliva. Bacteria want to form little cities of all the different species. It's not just one species of archaean or bacteria. So you give them a place to live, and they form, these are like their hotels, bacterial motels or hotels. They'll <laughs> occupy it, and they'll produce this slime. And in that slime will be all these different species going, okay, you guys make the methane. You guys break down the acids. You guys make the acids. You guys break down... You do the carbon dioxide, they all work together just like we do in society when they can settle. If they're nomadic, they're like, hey, we're all just trying to make a living here, so don't ask me to be you know, carving anything or making big sculptures. Cause I'm a... So nomadic bacteria don't do well, but when they come together in a colony and specialize, and then they bring in diversity, other types of bacteria, then they all start to cooperate and they produce a lot more gas. So you want bigger populations, more factories going on. So we're going to start putting these into the tanks in measured doses over the year to see if from a baseline reading of how much gas we get per, you know, per kilogram of food, then see how much can we increase it. Because what happens is if you don't put in surface area, we'll get to a point where we'll put in too much food, it'll go acid, like I said, they'll get indigestion, and the whole reaction will stop, and then we've got to wait for the population to bounce back. So a kid in... Kenya from the Maasai tribe where we were building was the one who said, why don't you just give them more places to live? Just throw stuff in for them to live on. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, give more bacteria, more places to live. They'll be able to eat more food, produce more gas. So we started putting in uh, PVC pipes into the systems in Kenya. And we're looking for anything that we can find. This is all over campus. So we'll be working with various materials, and seeing what, how far we can push this. Question for you. What could, what could break the barrier if we reach a theoretical maximum where the bacteria and archaeans are producing as much gas with as much food as we can hit them, and then we've reached a breaking point? What could go beyond that point? How can we get beyond that without changing the setup? Same tanks. What is it about bacteria and archaeans that you know that make them extraordinarily dangerous in certain circumstances to human beings? Replication? Yeah, their replication. How quick is it? One, two, three hours, three hours. 
it can be as little as 20 minutes. So their generation length is really short. What is that good for? What does that mean to us? It's also bad in the sense that when you give antibiotics to cows or take antibiotics, what, cow, what happens to the bacteria? It starts producing antibiotics. It starts yeah. And, and, and that resistance is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is showing us what about the bacteria? It's evolving. It's evolving. It's evolving. So now you think, wait a minute, they're evolving. They're adapting to new circumstances. Give them antibiotics, it kills them, and they evolve. They're no longer resistant. And we want these things to put out more gas without having to raise the temperature, without having to give it more food. We want efficiency improvements. So, we evolve. We potentially can create new species of bacteria because their reproduction rate is so fast, their generation is so fast. So here at Mercy College, working on this project, you can be responsible for creating urban bacteria that are ready to help humanity solve our urban problems because you work in cooperation and symbiosis with them. You co-create with them. Say, hey guys, um, we don't have a whole lot more food, but you want to live, right? So how do you do that? You stress them. You give them a lot of food in the beginning, and they're like happy, and then so like, yeah, you give them no food. Like, <laughs> a bunch of them die. The survivors pass on those genes. Throw at them stuff that isn't, you know, uh, say, say you want to try to get them to eat paper. Cardboard. We know that termites have bacteria in their guts that eat paper and cardboard, and goats eat paper. And why not find a way to take all the flyers and bills that you, you know, take your bills, bring them here, and say, ah, tear them up, and all those uh, junk mail that you get, and let's feed them to the bacteria and evolve them to eat our junk mail. It's got carbon. That's what they want to eat. Let's find a way to do it at the lowest possible temperature. Let's find a way to do it when there's toxic gases in the room. The potential to take these organisms and select for the traits that are mutually beneficial for their population and for ours is enormous. This is the frontier of microbiology. And at Mercy College, we are a biology-strong institution. We're not an engineering institution. I've worked with MIT students from the D-Lab who are taking these systems down to Nicaragua. They're engineering students. We don't go that angle because we don't have that faculty, but we do have you. You've got the biology and the way you think biologically. Okay, let's play God. Let's pull the strings. Go, hey guys, we need you because i got to have a little teeny system that's only this big I want in my house that I can put under my kitchen sink and it should produce all the electricity for my whole house. Possible? Theoretically, maybe. If we push these organisms to their limit and let them evolve new tricks, they will co-evolve with us. And this is, I think, how we're going to solve the problems of the 21st century. We're going to get into a relationship with our microbes, and we're then going to solve all the waste problems. Because who ate the, the, oil, the, Gulf spill, the oil in the Gulf spill from British Petroleum? I can bias that answer. Who ate it? Um, how did it get solved? Bacteria. The bacteria. There's turns out that there are bacteria living in the seeps of the Gulf of Mexico that are always encountering oil, but they just lived in that restricted region. Once the oil spill spread, bacteria spread with it, ate all the oil. And that doesn't say that oil spills aren't bad. In other oceans, in other parts of the ocean, it destroys everything. It just so happened that particularly evolved lineage was there. Whoo for humanity. <laughs> But, but similarly, there are bacteria that live in the Arctic and live in the Antarctic. We were up in Alaska doing the same work, and we didn't use any cow or, Well, we had one tank with cow manure for controls, and then we had lake mud from Alaska, from Fairbanks and from uh, Cordova, and we took this lake mud, and we got these guys making biogas at a pizza restaurant down at freezing temperatures because they've adapted to that cold. So it's, there's even speculation, a friend of mine, Kevin Hand, from National Geographic as well, we both are on National Geographic grants, he explores whether there's bacteria living on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. These guys are hardy little critters. And they are okay, whoa. You know. So using your, your biological acumen, every time you now study and take an exam, I hope you will think about helping us engineer solutions for our problems in the future. Because that's really why you're here, is to make a better future for yourselves, your families, your friends, right? Now we're giving an opportunity between Mike, who's a, a faculty mentor of this, our department chair, Anthony Kanger, myself, Dr. Colhane, 
You've got Jared Britt, who's the leader of Envisage, the Mercy Sustainability and Justice Club. And uh, would you like to say something about the club? <clears throat> uh, well, it's, we're going official, uh, hopefully this semester, by the end of the semester. Hopefully everything will be together. Um, and the whole goal of the club is uh, we're not hippies. That's really <coughs> the message of the club. We're not hippies. We are pragmatic, scientifically minded people who see problems, see issues, have experienced them. We have a lot of people in our clubs that are from uh, poorer areas in the world. Um, one of our, my friends is from Trinidad, and he's already talking about trying to take this technology to Trinidad. So the whole club is about solving problems. We're not going to preach hug a tree. We're going to preach feed the tree to this other machine that we can make wood gas out of, gasification. <coughs> uh, we're not going to teach, you know, pick up your bags and recycle them. We're going to teach pick up your bags and we'll teach you how to make gas and oil out of it. Uh, with a machine that will fit on your countertop that they make in Japan. Uh, so the whole idea behind the club is to teach solutions, to teach skills, and to teach ways of thinking that will help people be able to solve problems for themselves when we have things like Hurricane Sandy, which is our big go-to uh, thing right now. It was so traumatic for a lot of individuals who were out of power and didn't have all the essential things that they really needed. It, you know, it was really tough for them. Or you think about uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit and things like that, and just having the technology and the ability to bring in to teach people how to do this themselves. Here, this is how you do it. Our whole thing is train a trainer. We train people how to build these things or how to do it, and then we they train somebody else and they train someone else to pay it forward type of idea. So that's what the club's all about. So if anybody's interested, um, you can talk to uh, Professor Rivera, my, um, or stay after a minute, I'll just take down your information. But we're getting it started right now. Hopefully we're gonna start uh, officially uh, by next semester, we'll have it really up and running. Um, but it is going to be available on Blackboard Collaboration, so you don't even have to be at the meeting. You can log on your computer, sit in on the meetings, uh, and you'll be part of the club as well. So it's going to be a completely interactive, online, distance learning. All the satellite campuses for Mercy are, are it's going to be involved in. So uh, I hope, you know, if anybody is, is interested, that you guys <coughs> join us. And recruiting, recruiting a trip for my class next semester. If you're interested, we're having a class in psychology called the Psychology of Eco-Friendly Development. And the course is, um, the course is basically building, working with systems like this. We're also going to, uh, we're going to start We're going to be building solar panels, solar hot water systems out of copper pipe which is what we did in Egypt, a bunch. And uh, we're going to be doing fo soldering together photovoltaic cells for solar electric panels. We're going to be building small wind generators, bicycle Robots. generators, all the kind of technologies that Jared's talking about that need to be spread around the world to get people through disasters. And by the end of the quarter, or the, the semester, there is an optional but highly recommended trip. I say optional because Mercy doesn't have the funding to send students, but uh, there's a trip that's being planned for the class to Israel to the Arava Institute of Environmental Sustainability, who's a partner with us, and uh, that will be two weeks sometime with them, sometime across the, the road at Kibbutz Lotan, which is part of the um, Echo Village Network of the world, the Global Echo Village Network, where they have composting toilets that look like really nice, I mean, fancy looking toilets, and they're composting. There's no use any water, they just turn rice straw that the farmers give them into fertilizer. They have straw bale buildings. They have like hobbit houses made of rammed earth. They've got, you know, they teach their, their students to build and their community members to build their own electric systems and solar systems. And so it's going to be time on that kibbutz. And then for those who want to stay longer, we will go across the Sinai Desert to Egypt, see the pyramids, and then go into the slums of Egypt where I do a lot of my work at the Christian Zebelin garbage pickers who used to keep pigs, and uh, now because the pigs were all slaughtered by the government because of the swine flu, they are building biogas systems to turn the city's waste. Wonderful people. Uh, so you get to see parts of Egypt that you'd never think of, but you get to see the tourist things as well. Um, the obligation for the course, there are, for people who go on the trip, because it's expensive, I mean, we have 2,000 bucks, they have no obligations during the course except to come to class and learn and do building and then raise money, help raise money for themselves, do activities to raise money for the class. If you get on the trip, then you get an A. Because that's, we have to give incentives for people because it's tough to raise that kind of money. So you go on the trip, you get an A. 
if you don't, you learn a lot of really cool stuff, and then you make YouTube videos, and you write papers, and you try to invent stuff, and you get your grade that way. But we're going to try to make it really easy for incentives to get students out, because it's, it's a big deal to take a trip all the way to the Holy Land. So I'm making a pitch for that. Whether you go on the trip or not, I think you might find a fun course. It involves a lot of hands-on biology. And then you can sign up with, uh, with the club as well. We have a Facebook group, Envisage Mercy, that's got already 67 people, about 20 from Mercy. And the majority of the people, it's a Mercy club, but we got people from like other countries who are joining. It's weird. Because I think everybody, they're like, see, like, wow, there's like a college that wants to like, save the world. So if that's your mission, to save the world, welcome aboard. If there's any other questions, we're happy to take them, but otherwise. <laughs> okay.